tonight. We're looking forward to uh, this wonderful time together. And uh, then we have communion following, and so I've got to remember that. If, if it's about five after seven and I'm still droning on, you know, do what the little kids did in the choir this morning. It'll get my attention, and uh, I'll go, ah, communion. So, uh, wow. Oh, I was going to say, we have a, an eager questioner, but no, you walked right by. Okay, I'm ready. Does anybody have a question? We'll go, oh, boy, we really have an eager. Oh, two. Oh, my. Um, I think you beat Josh to the microphone, but we'll listen to both of them. So, Josh, can't wait to hear it, but John. All right. The Bible clearly says, do not murder. Yet, later in the Old Testament... God commanded the Israelites to wipe out entire nations. So basically, where is the line between killing and murder? Uh, the conquest. So you were talking about that. And uh, the wipeout, that's a very interesting topic. And the line between killing and murder. That is really a good question, John. Now, don't go too far away, okay, so I can see your smile and know I can finish uh, and everything. Okay, Josh, I'm ready. Uh, the question I have comes in First John, and it came from a comment I had on Facebook from another pastor. Uh, it seemed kind of proud, but maybe if you could elaborate on maybe what John's it seems like John's contradicting himself here, which I know that's not true, but if you could explain it in more detail. In verse 8 in chapter 1, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us, which I think we can all agree. And then if you get over to chapter 5, and you can kind of, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 3, um, 4 through uh, 9, basically. It says everyone who practices sin also practices law lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And then you can kind of go through it more, but um, the question is, um, chapter 6, no one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Um, no one, chapter 9, or verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because the seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. I guess his, his point was, as believers, we should no longer sin anymore. And it seems like that's uh, the sanctification process for us. I mean, we try to strive for that, but I, I know myself, I seem to fail uh, all the time. So is it the word practicing is in there three or four times? And is it practicing without repenting, or is it um, just the practice in itself, I guess? That is a great question. Thank you, Josh. So I'll answer them. Yes, no. There we go. Now, <laughs> see, someone asked if I could do that. You know, answer with one word. So, uh, Dory, okay. wait a minute. You have to, you can share it, but you got to wait. I, I haven't even got these two done. But Dory, the, I'm ready. All right, I'm ready? Yeah. Lebanon, yep. He, he, liked, he immediately liked Saul. And he supplied, I believe it was the cedars, the mm -hmm. river, and the skilled workmen. Mm -hmm. And at the end of 20 years, so I guess, did they build the temple and a palace and a white house and stuff like that? So mm -hmm. then, uh, I guess, uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre, Tyre, had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress and gold, as much as he desired. And King Solomon then gave Hiram. 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Then Hiram went from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, but they did not please him. So he said, what kind of cities are these which you have given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul. 
Afghanistan, yeah. yeah. That's still called Kabul today. And then the next verse said, then Hiram went, sent the king 120 talents of gold. So they were still giving each other troops. So I just, that's my burning theological question. That is a good one. Uh, yeah, I, I love it. So, okay. No more. This is way too many for the night. Um, let's just, let's do a little theology of murder uh, and then talk about um, killing, uh, you know, and the, uh, uh, you know, the Sixth Commandment and all of that about not murdering. And um, actually the conquest is uh, even, John actually asked multiple questions here. Uh, this is about war. Um, the bottom line is killing and murder, and murder, and even um, tied with this is the whole idea of capital punishment. I mean, do you right a wrong with what looks like another wrong by killing someone? Um, so, but let's, let's, this will be a fun, uh, this, this is like sitting at, at dinner reading through the Bible. Let's start in Genesis here uh, and look up Genesis, Cain and Abel, uh, Genesis 4 will get us to the first murder and, and see how God defines that. So Genesis 4, and it says in Genesis 4, um, let's see, uh, verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Uh, verse 7, if you do well, won't you be accepted? Now look at verse 8. This is the first murder in the Bible. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. This is really interesting. And I know that John didn't ask us about this, but Cain is big. He's the only person mentioned in the book of 1 John. That's significant. I mean, we just heard from 1 John. He's the only person, human, talked about in 1 John. And uh, Cain is, is an important person because it says in... Uh, John 8, Jesus said that Satan, you're of your father the devil, and the, the less of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Satan. So Satan, that's an eight by the way, Satan uh, incited Ab Cain to kill his brother Abel. And that becomes our first murder in the Bible. And um, it's interesting that they let him live. Did you notice that? Nothing happened. Cain lived. He planted cities and everything. But if you keep turning to chapter 9, then God lays down the law, literally. And what he says in verse 5, uh, by the way, a lot of things happen in chapter 9. And this is just because we're going by, and that's one of the benefits of uh, reading um, to answer questions. Instead of just citing things, to actually look at the passage, this is uh, what we call the Noahic covenant or Noachan covenant. It's the covenant God made with Noah. And uh, what the Lord says is five, surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast I will require it, from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of the man. Uh, and then it says, verse six, whoever sheds man's blood. So we're still talking about murder here. Uh, Whoever sheds man's blood, nine, six, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. So God says there, there's something very important about human life, and to end it uh, is, is such a travesty that for murder, shedding man's blood, that's the institution of capital punishment by God before Moses. So. Some people, you know, try and tie, like, the homosexual uh, legislation. They say it's Jewish or it's Old Testament or something. But God has this covenant with humanity. And it's the institution of, basically, of civilization uh, having rules. By the way, also, if you notice what happens in verse 3 is, humans were vegetarians before, most, it appears, before the flood. Adam and Eve ate everything, but it doesn't ever talk about them eating and, and you know, having steaks and, and stuff like that. But here, it, it's interesting, after the flood, humans didn't have to be vegetarian. And it says, uh, verse three, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, 
and I'll give you all things, even as the green herbs, as you've been eating plants, now you're going to get to uh, be uh, omnivores and uh, eat um, no longer just a vegetarian diet. So that's murder starts right after the fall. God institutes in Genesis 9 capital punishment. But now we haven't really defined um, this. What's the difference between kill, killing someone, like in warfare, and murder? And uh, so what we do here, and by the way, Phil taught me this neat old thing. Look at that. I learned how to interleave pages. Uh, he's amazing. Let's go to the sixth commandment in Exodus 20. And I want you, and in fact, if you have your Bible, and if you like to mark in your Bible, this question that John brought up is a very common one, especially among college students, you know. They're always interested in capital punishment because it seems so inhumane, and war, and killing in war, and all that stuff. And so, um, let's see, here we go. Honor your father and mother, uh, verse 13. You shall not murder. So we're in Exodus, I'm sorry, I don't know if I said Exodus. 20, 10 commandments, and it's uh, verse 13, you shall not murder. So God says no murder. And that's interesting, it's just a statement, doesn't define it. But if, if you keep going down to uh, chapter 21, I actually have from verse 13, you know, I, I in my Bible I circle verse 13 and I have a line going like this across to 2112. That's called daisy chaining. You know, it's a fun way to study the Bible. You find uh, connected things, and then in your mind, you just always connect them. But, but see in 2112, it says, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. However, if he did not lie in wait, but God, God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place where he may flee. Whoa. So, so God said, you can kill someone and flee it? Wow. Verse 14, if a man acts with premeditation. There, now we're getting into the legal code. You know, jurisprudence. Premeditated murder. That's the idea, where it comes from. God thought of it. He says, if someone acts with premeditation against his neighbor, now we're in 2114, and kills him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And if he strikes his father or his mother, put to death, and kidnaps and sells him, for he's found his hand, he surely be. Wow. So now there are capital offenses. But the, the key one is murder is defined right here. So now we find out what murder is. Murder is not just, you know, you're driving your car and, and someone, you know, falls in the road in front of you, you run over them, you killed them, but you didn't murder them, the Bible's saying. And so, but it doesn't stop there. If you keep going, look at 22, chapter 22. Now you can do another, I mean, if you like doing stuff like that, you can go to 22 too. Now we've got something else people ask about. So there, there is what we call today manslaughter, you know, that there, yeah, you did kill him, but you didn't want to, try to, or you didn't intend and premeditate it. You, you did kill them, but you didn't murder them. So, no murder, the sixth commandment. It's differentiating between murder and manslaughter, and accidental, or even uh, you got angry in the moment and, uh, and hit him too hard, or whatever. But now, look what 22.2 says. I'll start in one. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters or sells it, restore five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. Now there's the interesting thing. We wouldn't have, how many million do we have in prison in America? One million, two million, three million people? I think we're at three million, our prison population. And I think it costs about $50,000 a year to keep them in jail. And what are they in jail for? You know, there's some really mass murders, but there's a lot of other things that, you know, thieves and three strikes, you're out, people and everything. You know, it's interesting, in the Mosaic Law, the, what they did is the people that need to be executed were right away. And the people that didn't weren't. And they had all this restitution stuff. And, and you worked it off and you lived in a community and everybody knew you and you stole and you paid it back and so you're back. and. It's interesting, they didn't have three million people 
in jail, which is just amazing where we've come to. But look at this. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, now there's a question people ask all the time. If I have a gun in my nightstand and a prowler comes into my house and I shoot him and he dies, I always remember when I was growing up, I don't know what the laws are in Michigan, but Judge Coleman way back in the 70s or 60s, uh, we'd always see him at Bill Knapp's and, and he'd always tell us, and this was the state of law in the 60s and 70s, he said, if you shoot a prowler, make sure you drag them so they're inside the house. Uh, he used to tell people Bill Knapp's that. Now Bill Knapp's is gone and so is he probably. But uh, the idea is there is a precedence in the Bible. Uh, if a thief, if, if someone is, is in your home and, and you strike him so he dies, look at what verse 2 says. God said this. There is no guilt for his bloodshed. But John just said, wait, wait a minute. You know, our original question. I thought God says no murder. Isn't killing murder? Well, not always is killing murder. See, the Bible very clearly defines, and what we would call this is what? Self-defense. Um, and again, you know, it doesn't mean that you take pot shots at people out your window that you don't like, you know? <laughs> Say they're threatening me or they're, you know, whatever. But you see, it's very clearly defined here. So this, this is, and, and there are other places in the Bible that it talks about this, and there's the whole city of refuge. Uh, because, you know, you, you even do this um, self-defense killing and people get upset at you. And, and so you could flee somewhere where the relatives were coming after you and you could live there. And that's all in Joshua, the cities of refuge and all that. Um, but back, back here, it's clear murder in 2112, when you, and by the way, it, it, in Exodus 2112, uh, Exodus even says, if, if you hit him with a stone, it's murder. But if you hit him with a stick, it's not. See, I mean, it's, it's, if you're getting in a fight and you're fighting and hitting each other and you have a stick and it happens to kill someone, you weren't really probably trying to kill them. But if you have a stone in your hand, you were, or an iron instrument and everything. So you can read all that and it's all the mosaic. But the sense of it is this, that God sees the difference and God also sees the difference between self-defense and murder. He, he differentiates. So that's the first part of John's question. Then he went into, what about this? What about, and this is liberals, that's people that don't um, believe in inspiration usually, and they don't believe in the deity of Christ sometimes in the resurrection. They also uh, don't like the, you know, the char moral character of God. They're liberals. Um, they just want to tone everything down, but they really jump all over the conquest. And what I'm talking about in the conquest is, um, and let's just go there just so you see why they get mad. Go to Joshua. So you're in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. And God tells Joshua to go uh, to Jericho. And he says, I want you, uh, he called the children of Israel. And uh, they go in, chapter 6. And he says in there somewhere, um, you know, don't, I don't know where it is, but it says it in there somewhere. Don't leave anybody alive. Don't kill them all. Kill them all. Not just there. They were supposed to, in the conquest, they were supposed to kill in certain specified cities every man, woman, child. In fact, it's not just there. It's, it's not just in Joshua. Also, Amalek uh, with King Saul, that's where he got in trouble in 1 Samuel 15. Um, God says, I want you to kill every Amalekite, everyone that breathes. And so, whoa, God says, no murder. He says, the sixth commandment, no murder. He says, in self-defense, but I think the Jericho people were defending themselves. The army came to them. They, you know, 
so the Israelites weren't defending themselves, they were doing something else. And so what, what is going on in the conquest? And that takes us to uh, warfare. And uh, I don't know how far in John wants to go with this, but the conquest was God fulfilling a promise that, that he made. He told Abraham way back, way back when camels were really in Israel, back in Genesis 12 through 24, even though the National Geographic doesn't think there were, God saw them and told us they were. And I'm glad no one asked me about that because I would talk about that too. But uh, um, in the conquest, God told Abraham hundreds and hundreds of years before Joshua, he said, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. You see, God, God sees sin and it rises before him and not one sin that any human has ever committed isn't in his face. That, that's why God sees all the sins. We see people, God sees the sins. They're, they come before him, just, they're just in his face all the time. And God saw a group of people, uh, the Amorites they're called, and uh, in Genesis 15, God says that the Amorites, that's another, that's one of the group of the Canaanites, the Amorites, he says in Genesis 15 that their iniquity is not yet full. Um, it was growing, it was ascending. It's kind of like in Genesis 6, God said that every intention of man's heart was only evil continually, and I'm not going to tolerate it much longer. They just have 100 years, and I'm going to exterminate them. God, God's response to sin is extermination. And he exterminated every human on earth except for eight. I'm glad Russell Crowe made it, right? He was in the ark. I'm just teasing, you know. There, isn't it amazing all these Bible movies that are coming out these days? But only eight human beings made it in the ark. Everyone else died. And if you calculate the size of family and the length of life, there's probably a billion plus people on earth. And God killed 999,999,992 of them. And he left eight. So we already have the, the, God does not call it murder when God exterminates sinners. He did it in the ark and the flood. He does it in, in Genesis uh, when, when he destroys Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 14 and exterminates Sodom, Gomorrah, and the cities of the plain and rains down fire and brimstone on them. So God exterminates sinners. What was the problem with the Amorites? Well, what's interesting is, um, and it's only coming out now with our new cultural things, what the archaeologists found in the Canaanite Amorite um, culture is... Um, vile. They were vile people, morally. In fact, most Canaanites, one thing the archaeologists found, when they would build a city and they would lay the, the first stone of some special building, they always find a clay jar in, under the foundation stone, you know, the first stone that was laid, they find a clay jar under there that had a, an infant buried alive. That was what Canaanites did. They dedicated buildings by burying an infant in a jar under the, they were so inhumane, they were murderous of children. In fact, Carthage, Carthage, uh, the Phoenicians uh, that were, that, that, that are people that are coastal people that are related to the, uh, same group of people, when they excavated Carthage, they found 60,000 babies in jars in these amazing infant killing and, and a lot of other horrible stuff. They were into witchcraft and everything else. And God says, I'm sending my chosen people of promise into the land of Canaan, and I don't want those baby-killing, pagan, murderous, grossly immoral idol-worshiping people in the land. And God said, just like with the ark and just like with Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, I want you to um, totally wipe out the Canaanites. I want you to exterminate them. 
And he added to that list afterward the Amalekites. Um, and they were to be all exterminated. And you say, boy, how, how can that be? It's, it's just a little picture from time to time of what all of us deserve. See, the wages of sin is death. And if there's no grace and no patience or mercy from God, he zaps them. God zaps people. And we're so thankful that God is forbearing, that he is merciful, that he lets sinners shake their fists at him for their whole lifetime, most of them, and mock him. And he doesn't zap them. God zapped the whole world. God zapped several cities. God zapped an entire uh, culture of the Canaanites. God wiped out a whole clan, uh, the Amalekites, and, you know, and there are many others. But back to John Greaves' question, um, this is a whole different topic. This has to do, this wiping out of people has to do with the holiness of God and giving us little foretastes of hell. God hates sin immensely. It rises before him. It, uh, in fact, murder, particularly, the Lord says that anytime someone's murdered, their blood cries. That's what happens with Abel. It cries from the ground to him. So murder, capital punishment, and homicide, and manslaughter, that's one thing. This is a whole different, this is whole theology. This is why God kills half of all the people in the tribulation, because they will not repent, Revelation 9, of their murders, of their drugs, of their immorality. And God says, enough is enough. Now he's preaching the gospel. He's sending the 144,000. He has the angel preaching. He has the two witnesses. But God is, hates sin. Now, one more point here. This is really interesting. That, that is, what does God say about war? Is war always wrong? Is war ever? And, and what's interesting about that, if we go just for a minute, let's, let's do, let's go to the New Testament. Um, let me see. Luke, 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 Luke 3. I want to show you something for just a second because let's just talk about war for a second. War, soldiers, um, you know, and and uh, we're Americans, okay? Uh, what, what about war? And can you be a soldier carrying around a, an instrument that kills humans? Is that wrong? And it's so interesting, in, ch in chapter 3 of Luke, and, and we could uh, look at other passages, a couple others maybe, but look at 3.12. Um, and then a tax collector also came up to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he says, don't collect any more taxes than is appointed for you. This is John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. It's in the Bible, and it, there's no comment that he's mistaken. So paying taxes, and, and uh, I got an email about this. Someone said, uh, uh, is it right for me to protest abortion by withholding part of my taxes because a certain percent of everybody's taxes goes into abortion? Is that biblical? And if they would have asked that tonight, I would have said, no, it's not because they were doing heinous things in the Roman Empire. And, and they were also occupied. They were God's people, they were under occupation, they were being oppressed and everything else. And God says, pay your taxes. That's an interesting, but that isn't what we're talking about. Look, no one asked me that. Look at verse 14. Likewise, a soldier. Now here comes one of the occupiers himself, a Roman soldier and occupy it'd be like an american soldier in afghanistan or american soldier in iran or iraq or an american soldier you know wherever that that we have uh, stayed around to to keep the peace and a soldier asked him saying and what shall we do this would be a perfect moment for a prophet of god to say quit you should not be a soldier it's morally wrong you career killer bad, right? Sixth command, right? No. Look what he says. He doesn't say get saved and get a new profession. He says uh, don't intimidate anyone. Don't accuse them falsely. And be content with your wages. And, and 
Soldiers are talked about a lot. Keep going from Luke. Luke has a sequel, you know, the book of Acts. Go over to Acts chapter 10. It's, it's one seamless uh, author's inspired writings. And, and look at uh, chapter 10 of Acts. And uh, we're looking at Cornelius, and I have to find the verse because it's very interesting. Um, uh, verse 21 of chapter 10. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius, and they said, Yes, I am whom you seek. For what reason have you come? In Acts 10.22. And then they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man who fears God and has a good reputation uh, of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and hear words from you. And on and on it goes. And here goes the whole you know, Cornelius' account. And, and even when Peter recounts this, do you understand what Cornelius was? He was a career soldier. He was a centurion. That means he moved from home in Italy to be an occupying supervisor of 100 troops. He was a career soldier. And, and look how the Bible describes him. And there's no... The Lord affirms this because when, when he talks about Cornelius, Peter, when he gives this testimony, he says in verse 35, in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. He's talking about Cornelius. Peter doesn't say that Cornelius uh, was an unjust man, verse 22, and, and he didn't fear God. He was a professional killer. It's interesting that God never disparages soldiers. And, and, he, and in fact, if, if you talk about a long list, Hebrews 11, Hall of Fame, has many career soldiers in it. For time will fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Jephthah and Samson. They're all killers in the sense of killing humans. But they were soldiers. Now, just for a second, um, Look at Matthew, because I, I remember, I, this is such a common question among college kids. They go, well, what about war period? I mean, isn't Jesus a pacifist? That's a good question, pacifist. Uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, um, let's see, where is it? Um, let's see. 5... See, where he says be at peace. Oh, well, you guys can read it. You know what I mean. Uh, oh, here we go. It's 521. You've heard it says, don't murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment I save you. Whoever is angry with his brother. It's 521 and 22. So Jesus said, Jesus reaffirmed the Old Testament. Jesus said, uh, he, says he says, no murder. So it, murder is bad. Um, Jesus says, don't murder. So, what they do from that is they say Jesus was a pacifist. And pacifists say no war. So that's where we get the whole no war segment of Christianity. The people that won't bear arms at all. They're pacifists. And they say Jesus was a pacifist because Jesus said in Matthew 5, no murder. Okay, so with that line of thought, keep going to Romans 13 because the Spirit of God, there's only one God. There are not three. Jesus isn't one and Father's different. There's one God in three persons. So anything the one does, the other two are total in agreement with. There's no disunity in the Trinity. And in chapter 13, the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to say, um, that the soldier doesn't, uh, verse 4. Paul says in Romans 13, 4, Romans 13, 4, look what Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, who is one with Christ, Father, Son, and Spirit, the Trinity, and they don't ever disagree. Um, for he is God's minister to you for good. If you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. 
So the question is, was Jesus a pacifist? No, he wasn't. Because Jesus is the one who met with Joshua. He was the commander of the Lord's host. Joshua fell on the ground and worshiped him. Jesus told Joshua, destroy Jericho, kill every person in it except Rahab and her family. Jesus is no pacifist. Jesus is the one that instituted the destruction of the Canaanites. He is the one that came and walked and talked to Abraham, the angel of the Lord that was talking to Abraham and said, I'm going to burn up Sodom. That's pre-incarnate. That is a Christophany, we would call it, a pre-incarnate visitation of Christ. Before he was incarnated, he came in a human form and talked to people like, you know, Mano and like, you know, all of those times that the angel of the Lord, whenever they bow down and worship him and the angel doesn't say, don't worship me, it's not an angel. It's God. So Jesus is not a pacifist he, because what he's saying there is he is against murder and retro, you know, people getting angry and getting even and the vigilante thing. He is not saying war is wrong. He's the one that instituted war. In fact, if you read Proverbs, you know what it says? It says, before you go to war, make sure you sit down and plan it well. Never says that in the Bible, before you murder someone, plan it well. Before you commit adultery, make sure you really plan it well. But it says, before you go to war, if you're wise, Make sure, Jesus even said that. He says, doesn't a man, before he goes to war, count his army to make sure he can win going against that person? The Lord is never, never a pacifist in the sense of what we've gotten to today. Uh, basically today, well, basically today, we have Christian activists. And what that means is, if the government says to go to war, at, you just go to war, no matter what, because the government told you. That's called an activist. So the first view about war is activism. The second view is pacifism. Pacifism. And that is no war, period. But there's a third one. And it, by the way, this is the majority of all evangelical scholars. It's called the just war. And what that is, is right here in where we were, in chapter 13 of Romans, in verse 4. To execute wrath on him who practices evil. And what it, what it involves is, is defense against an, an evil aggressor. It's kind of like the uh, um, person breaking in your house that we saw way back in chapter 22 of Exodus. That just war. If someone starts evil toward you, you can fight back. So immediately, I'm glad no one asked this, someone would ask, whoa, what about that? I'm glad no one asked, so I won't answer that. But there seems to be, there seems to be a just war that, that uh, when, when God commanded Israel to destroy their enemies, uh, when, when God sent David out to all those marauders that were coming at Israel from every angle to go wipe them out, just war. This, this is never in the New Testament or the Old Testament, the, the pacifist view. This, though, is a danger. The, the Christian activist. But the government tells me, go anywhere. I mean, there is limit from God. And, and we have to be very careful about thinking that anything the government says you're supposed to do, we're still supposed to say, I have to obey God rather than man at some points. And so Christian activism is not the majority, the just war view that, that it is proper uh, to go to war in defense against evil for aggressors and uh, I mean, World War II would be a good point, you know, holding off until they hit Pearl Harbor, you know, to give a reason for the response. But, um, wow, it's 6.58. So, uh, where, how did we get to that anyway, John? Oh, we were right here. Is there a difference between killing and murder? And uh, yes, there is. And uh, God does say killing is always, uh, murder is always wrong. But God does define murder, as we've seen in several ways, to be differentiated from the warfare that he instituted. And he did set up capital punishment. And Josh, you'll have to ask that again. And Dory, so will you. 
because it's time for communion. So, boy, that was fun. Um, so what, what we need to do is just change uh, gears and think about why God wiped out everybody, and that was because he hates sin. And communion is a time when we remember that God so hated sin that there was no hope for us, and so he turned his wrath on Christ. That's what we're celebrating communion tonight, that we are so guilty of our sin that we could never go into God's presence unless God's wrath was satisfied. And that was only by him pouring out his wrath on Christ. So let's bow before the Lord. The men are going to prepare to uh, serve us the Lord's Supper. But let's just take a moment before the Lord and thank him and ask for him to prepare our hearts. Dear Father, you've told us that communion is a time where we are giving thanks. We are blessing your name because we deserve to be exterminated. We're all sinful, guilty, in your sight, so far from your glory. But you made Jesus to become sin for us. And you treated him on the cross as if he had committed our sins. And for that, we thank you. And you've told us that as oft as we eat this bread, that we proclaim Christ. We proclaim that we're identifying with his sacrifice as our only hope. That we believe that he, by one sacrifice, as Hebrews 10 says, forever removed all of our sins, past, present, and future. And right now, tonight, at this communion, we give thanks to you that you, instead of exterminating us, you exterminated your son in our place. He took our sins upon himself. May that fill our hearts with gratitude because you love us so much. Thank you for this bread that reminds us of Christ who in his own body bore our sin on the cross and bless us as we worship him and remember his sacrifice tonight. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As the men come and pass the bread to us, we're going to sing that great old hymn, uh, Jesus Paid It All. And just through these words, let's offer our thanks to him. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Now, you, you hear, and, and it comes out so often, I hear people in their prayers, they they are thanking the Lord for sending so much snow to remind us that though our sins are red like crimson. Now, you know, when, whenever you hunt, you, you realize how sharp a contrast that is. If you've ever hunted in the snow and tracked the deer, it's so stark. The whiteness of the snow and the crimson stain that you have to follow. And so there is, there is a beautiful picture here that our sins just stand out to God. But he, through sacrificing his own son, makes us appear like we never sinned. We're like brand new snow, unstained. And so, with that bread in your hands, the Lord said to us to perpetually, he instituted, this is called one of the ordinances. Jesus commanded us to perpetuate 
the celebration of communion to remember, the, never to get far away from the remembrance of, of what our sins deserve. And, and the way you see that is how God treated Christ. He was, he was marred more than any man. He, he was disfigured. Uh, they couldn't even recognize his face as human. That's how, how much the, the sin uh, caused the God allowed him to be so beaten and disfigured for us. But the scripture said, on that night when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, he said, this is my body. Now, he was standing there, so this doesn't mean it changes into his body. It just means this is forever a picture for us of his body that became sin for us. And he said, when we partake of this bread, it's reminding us that only partaking of Christ, believing in his death in our place, can we be saved. So he said, this do in remembrance of me, and let's partake together. Dear Father, I thank you that we can pause twice a month and as a body, one in Christ, we can turn our entire attention and the focus of our hearts at offering thanks to you. And I pray that right now you would be receiving like smoke rising from an altar the adoration and the thanks from each one of us who know that our sins are forgiven. May we truly be from our spirits thanking and blessing your name and worshiping you for your sacrifice. You also told us that the cup was a cup of blessing. And that cup of blessing is a reminder that the blood of Jesus Christ, your son, cleanses us from all sins. There is no condemnation we'll ever face because we're in you, O Christ. Because you have forever paid the price and removed the record and taken the penalty on yourself. So thank you for this cup of blessing, this picture of your blood. And I pray that as we sing this hymn, remembering you, that this will be a communion where it registers with even more of your saints. That because you died for us, we should be living a life that honors and glorifies and pleases you. And may this communion be a renewal, a reminder, and a, a recommitment to living that kind of life wherever you take us as we live here on earth. We live for you, our master. In the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. As the men pass the cups to us, we're going to sing Living for Jesus, a life that's true. And let's make that our offering to him tonight. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. This is based on what Paul said, the, the redeeming price that Jesus paid, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and that he died, that we should no longer be those who live for ourselves. We, we know that he purchased us with his own blood, and it's just like a slave that knew they had been bought. And by the time we get to 2 Corinthians, Paul says that 
that this communion reminds us we no longer live for ourselves, but unto him. And that's, that's what this hymn talks about, and that's what communion reminds us of. And so this cup is a cup of blessing. It reminds us we're blessed to be forgiven, but also reminds us that we're to bless the Lord with our gratitude now at communion, but with living our lives for his glory and for his sake alone. So Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant that's in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it, remembering me. Let's partake together. Now, just before I close in prayer, you can look up for a minute because there's also one other thing that we do at communion. It says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15 that if your brother, a fellow believer, sins against you, go and tell them their fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. 